guys, and welcome back to the Edison Club podcast. I'm your host, Mike, and tonight it's just me riding solo this week. So, uh, yeah, hold on tight because we're going all the way to the top on this roller coaster. This episode of this podcast is completely unscripted. I have a couple topics in mind that I want to just kind of go over and lightly touch on, but I'm not reading from a script, nor do I have like even an outline for this episode. It's kind of just going to be old man ramble for 45 minutes or an hour again, uh, which I have done a lot from time to time. So uh, it's October. I'm actually recording this on Wednesday and tomorrow is Halloween. So happy Halloween to everyone. Hope you have a fun, safe holiday. This video will be going up on Friday. So the next day after Halloween. So I guess I should actually say I hope that you had a good Halloween. Got lots of candy. Had fun at your parties and stuff like that. So the first thing I want to go over before I go too far and end up forgetting about it is if you are anywhere within driving distance to North Carolina next weekend, that would be the weekend of October the 9th and the and the 10th, Big Boy Gaming in Raleigh, North Carolina is going to be having a 2K Edison tournament on Saturday, November the 9th. And on Sunday, November the 10th, they will be having a 3K 3v3. So there are quite a few big names I've heard that are going to be making the trip down. I've heard some people all the way from Canada are actually coming down. So that's very cool. Really enjoy um, promoting stuff for Big Boy. They are the sponsor of the channel. Diego's a really cool guy. And I'm sure the event is going to be a lot of fun. BBG is a very chill place to go. You 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 can use OCG copies of cards, which kind of sweetens the pot for some people. So if you're want to play amaryllis but you're um kind of short on some amaryllis then just whip out the uh, the japanese copies bring them on they are perfectly legal at big boy gaming as they are not an ots sanctioned store which is also why they give away cash prizing so very nice it's always a fun time my friend justin will be judging and i think we're actually working on getting a stream set up put together for the saturday tournament which would be the 2k don't think we're going to stream on Sunday just because it's kind of a kind of a nightmare to try to stream a 3v3 because you can only stream either player A or player C. So you don't really get the full experience. But yeah, it's going to be a very good time. It's going to be, I believe, at the Raleigh Fairgrounds. So just make sure you look them up on Facebook. That's Big Boy Gaming. You can find the event details there. Uh, also, to the link to their Facebook page is in all of the video descriptions uh, of all of my videos. So if you're watching this on YouTube, let's go down below. If you're listening to this on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, wherever, uh, you can just go over to uh, my YouTube channel, The Edison Club, spelled just like that, uh, and you can go to literally any video description within like the past couple years, and it's it's in there. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, uh, the Quarter Century Bonanza set uh, comes out very soon. So if you're you've been living under a rock and you don't know anything about the Quarter Century Bonanza set. It's basically, I believe, like a 80-card set for advanced with a separate 200-card nostalgia card pool. So we've been getting leaks, or I guess actually announcements, for this set for a few weeks now. Usually it's uh, around 1 o'clock EST every day. They'll uh, show five or six cards that they've actually released that are going to be in that set. Well, apparently... um, Last night, someone actually made a video where they opened up this set very prematurely. And I'm not going to say who. I'm not going to link the channel. I don't want anything to do with that video, mainly just because they're they're not a Konami partner. We don't really know how they managed to obtain the set this much earlier, but I definitely do not want to catch any kind of flag for that. So if you know about the video, then you know. Um... And if you don't, I'm sure you can find it unless it's been deleted by this point. Like I said, this is Friday. Uh, This will be uploaded on Friday, but it is still there as of like 10 minutes ago. But he opened up uh, like two boxes of this set very early. We got to see some leaks that we didn't even know that we were getting. And yeah, so there's there's also been a lot of controversy around this set in general. I know a lot of advanced players are not happy with the set, kind of think that the nostalgia card pool should have been a set of its own that they shouldn't be ruining the advanced cards that come out of the set. And I kind of want to touch on that and talk about that for a minute here and kind of just talk about the fact that 
a lot of times competitive players don't go and buy sealed product. I know for me, I've probably bought less than five boxes of Yu-Gi-Oh in 20 years of me playing. Um, I've basically never bought sealed product. Like when I was a kid, my dad would take me to like Kmart and Walmart and buy packs and stuff. But I feel like that's just what you do when you're a kid. You know, like there's no there's no pro players that are going out and actively opening up, you know, 10, 15, 20 boxes or multiple cases and stuff like that, trying to like just pull what they need from the from the set. They're just going to go to TCG player or eBay or one of their connections, whatever, say, hey, I need these cards. It's what I need. So the casual fan base and the casual player base spend the most amount of money in Yu-Gi-Oh! 100%. Uh, they go, they get like the serotonin from opening up the set. People kind of swarm them, watch them open up stuff, try to buy stuff from them. And I really think that this quarter century Bonanza set really kind of, it appeals to such a broad audience of Yu-Gi-Oh! players. So I was talking to my teammate Austin Butcher about this earlier today. It's been a long time since they've actually released a set of cards that appeal to anyone that's playing the game. So the most recent ones that I can remember, outside of like Rarity Collection, uh, Rarity Collection 2, which did reprint some Edison cards and like Tinku cards, but the most recent ones that I remember, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, would be like the Legendary Collection, Yugi's World, Joey's World. I think there was one for Kaiba as well. But basically, they reprinted all of these old cards, including banned cards. So like Pot of Greed, Graceful Charity, Delinquent Duo, uh, Dark Magician of Chaos, which was still banned at the time. All of these iconic Yu-Gi-Oh cards, right? So like everything from like Legend of Blue Eyes, like Starter Decks, Invasion of Chaos, like whatever was popular uh, way back in the day, they got reprinted in there. But they also printed some cards that were like TCG Premier cards. So like most notably when Sixth Sense was printed, I believe in Joey's world as a common, a short print common. And then we also had like Harpy Dancer uh, originally came out of that set. And there are more than just those two, but those were the ones that come to mind. So the way that they marketed that was they caught the nostalgic players that just wanted to pull a Genzo or pull a pot of greed or pull a graceful charity. But they also targeted the modern play player base because they needed cards like six cents for their dragon roller deck or they needed harpy dancer for their harpy deck to be complete so they really captured what like all generations of Yu-Gi-Oh wanted so you know john could go to walmart john that grinds regionals every weekend says i'm going to buy two of these and hope i pull a six cents because i need one for this weekend and then uh timmy is going to go and say i haven't played Yu-Gi-Oh in 10 years wow, I used to play with BLS, I used to play with Chaos Sorcerer, this has Yugi on it, I'm going to buy this, this is really cool. And it's basically the same with the Quarter Century Bonanza set. You have a lot of cards in there that are appealing for advanced players, like I know it, SP Little Knight is in there, um, Triple Tactics Thrust is in there, there are a lot of other cards that are in there that are played in advance that I don't know a lot about, considering I haven't played advanced in like three years now. But in this set, there's also a separate 200 card nostalgia pool. So from what we've seen so far, this is anything from the game's conception up until um, very recently, actually, because I've seen Dark Magician has been in there. Stuff like Dandelion has been in there. Naturia Beast is in there. Gravekeeper Spy. They've also put things like Necroz of Trishula in there. So a lot of cards spread all across Yu-Gi-Oh's history. So in my opinion, I actually kind of feel like this set could be one of the greatest sets ever as far as as far as it goes to like appeal to a wide audience. So, you know, if I hadn't played Yu-Gi-Oh in 20 years and I went to a store and I picked up a pack of cards and I saw some weird, you know, link monster on it, I just put it back down and be like, I don't know what this is. But if I saw a Yu-Gi-Oh product and I was like, oh, I used to play this and I flip it over and on the back, I still see some random cards. I don't know what they do, but I also see Magician of Faith, Breaker of the Magical Warrior, Dandelion. I still see all these cards in the back. I'm like, wow, you mean to tell me like people still like want these cards? Like these cards were good when I was a kid. I'm going to buy this and crack it. I think that sheer from or from like a sheer profit uh, view, I think this set is going to be very, very good. Now, supposedly... We're at like 86 of the 200 card nostalgia pool that has been revealed so far. 
Uh, we do have a couple band cards that have since been revealed, which would be Cyberstein, the former SJC prize card, and also Dandelion, which was a jump card and was in the winning deck of the actual Edison format, uh, Quick Draw Dandy Warrior. That's the only two band cards that I'm fully aware of are in there. And that kind of addresses the elephant in the room. Like, as cool of a set as this is, as good as this is for Time Wizard formats in general, and just people that enjoy, like, nostalgic Yu-Gi-Oh!, are the band cards going to be in there? Are we going to get Amaryllis? Are we going to get Trap Dust Shoot? Are we going to get Royal Oppression? Are we going to get Cold Wave? Are we going to get all of these cards that people have been asking to be not only reprinted, but also reprinted in other rarities? A lot of people say yes, a lot of people say no, a lot of people are starting to feel disgusted, you know, like all oh, this set's bad, they're not reprinting anything that we want. Personally, I feel like, just based off the premise, so like, the first band card we saw was Cyberstein, and I was like, okay, maybe they put Cyberstein in there just because it was a prize card. That's why they put it in there, maybe. Then I saw Dandelion, and I'm pretty sure Dandelion either recently got printed in a Speed Duel set or is getting printed in a Speed Duel set alongside Maxi. So I was like, okay, well, that's two cards that are banned. And like the past several years, Konami historically like has not been printing banned cards, reprinting banned cards. But because, once I saw the Dandelion, I was kind of convinced, like, okay, they really are going to kind of ignore the band list and just print these nostalgic cards for the people that want them. So I feel like the last day of the reveals, and maybe it's they post like 30 cards on the same day or something like that, or maybe we'll start, they'll get one here or there, um, like next week. I feel like all of those cards are going to be in there. I feel like... I feel like Konami has actually been the most in touch with the Time Wizard community that they ever have been with a Yu-Gi-Oh community ever before. And I say that because people are asking for cards to be reprinted, and we want these cards to be printed, we want them to be easier to obtain, and they have thrown us a bone several times, giving us a lot of slots in like Rarity Collection 2, finding ways to also make it appeal to like advanced format players, like Obviously, in Rarity Collection 2, you get stuff like Charge of the Light Brigade, which really needed like a nice foil printing because the secret rare from Duel's Genesis went super, super high because Lightsworn got um, support in advanced format. So they've done a very good job and they've thrown us like little, little Easter eggs here and there, like Caius in an OTS pack, Blackwing Armed Wing OTS pack, different things like that they've given us. So I feel like they are in touch. I feel like there is someone out there that is like scouting for Konami, reading on YouTube comments, reading Facebook comments, deck profiles, whatever, and kind of taking mental notes that these cards need to be reprinted because we want the Time Wizard format to grow and people to keep playing. But if Amaryllis is $100, that's kind of gatekeeping some people from playing Amaryllis because a lot of people are like, oh, I want to play Plants in Edison. What can I play? Can I play Quick Draw? No, the deck's not really good, but Amaryllis is actually a pretty real deck. Shouts to uh, Nick Trutt and Team Little Man for uh, basically putting that deck on the map. So with all of that to be said, I do feel like all of those cards are going to be in there. And I kind of feel like they'll still be kind of expensive, especially the ones like Amaryllis. Like that's its first reprint and there's you can either get this reprinted one or you can get the original Super or I guess technically the Asian English, but they're all expensive. So I wouldn't put my money on Amaryllis coming out of there and being a $5 card. It could probably still be a $20, $30 card um, just because you only get one of those per pack and there's a 200 card pool. Same thing kind of goes with Royal Oppression, Trap Dust Shoot. You know, those, those don't, those need reprints because obtainability is very hard to get those cards at times. Common Trap Dust Shoots are well over $10 and there's just been no reason for those cards to actually get reprinted um until time wizards taken off so i feel like all of those will be in there uh so we have what 114 more cards to go um in the video that we saw um we did see some other cards that are in there that are technically retro cards but aren't part of the retro pool in the pack so we have things like armageddon knight is in there swap frog is in there um, we also have things like the dragon rulers are apparently in there as well. And the way the packs work is like you randomly get one card from the nostalgia pool inserted into a pack. 
And it can either be a QCR or it can be like a Platinum Secret Rare. So that was another thing that I saw a lot of players complaining about. Like, oh, I'm going to open up this pack and I'm going to pull some crappy Magician of Faith that's worth a dollar and it's not worth it. But like, you're not going to pull a QCR Magician of Faith and it be and it have replaced your Triple Tactics Thrust. You know, like you're not going to lose out on Thrust and get a banned card instead because it's it's a different card pool. It's added in there. It's different. So. Yeah, that's the Bonanza set. I'm super excited for it. Uh, you're definitely going to be able to like really bling out some of your Edison decks now. Like I was looking at it from the perspective of playing Twilight, and I was like, man, like it's kind of getting very close to the point where every card in my Edison deck could be QCR. But at that point, I feel like it just kind of becomes ridiculous and way too tacky. But you know, there's a lot of cards you could play in there that are QCR, and I, I personally am a big fan of QCRs. I know that some people are not. But I do like them, but I wouldn't want every card in my deck to be QCR. You know, I think it's nice to have, like, some ultis, some secrets, some champion pack supers, and a few QCRs here and there. I think it's, like, a good spread of different rarities. And some people are very true to playing the rarities that existed uh, in 2010, and I respect that as well. Um, I've done that for a while on some things. But then there's some things, like, I'm not paying $100 for a secret rare charge when I can get a QCR for 10 bucks or you could even just get like the reprinted secret rare uh, for like a dollar and it looks just as good. You know, it's just not like the original one, which some people, some people want the original one, you know, like to me, as long as it's like a nice rarity, I don't really care about the addition all that much. Uh, my light sworn deck has been a work in progress for about three years now. It's still not max, nor do I think it probably will ever actually be max, but it's nice, you know, and I, I have my own spin in there. Like I, I play the, the GLD one, uh, like Brain Control, GLD one, Rhoda, um, and there's another card, Heavy Storm. I like all those old gold rares. And I was recently playing, uh, GLD one, uh, Gold Sark. Pretty sure it comes out of the first one. Uh, and I finally did upgrade those to QCR because I really wanted to get like the Pharaoh Secret Rare. They're just so much. And I decided I would just play QCRs, and I'm a big fan of those. I like those a lot. So, yeah, that kind of wraps up everything about the quarter century Bonanza set. I'm really stoked to see what else ends up coming out of there. I'm still not buying any of that because if there's a card I want, I would just buy the card instead of <laughs> instead of just opening up a bunch of random packs. Also, too, because me personally, I don't need a bunch of stuff for modern that I have to move or just sits in a desk drawer. So I'm. I'm one of the competitive players. I'll just buy the singles from TCG player or eBay or a friend um, and leave the sealed product opening to everyone else. But hopefully that kind of clears the air to anyone that's like upset about the Bonanza set. Um, I think that Konami is doing a great job, which is something I haven't said very, very much, if ever. So, yeah. So let's take some time here and kind of jump ship and let's kind of just ramble here for a minute and talk about. Let's talk about Light Sworn. Let's talk about my my Light Sworn experience here. I'm just gonna spend the rest of this time yapping. So I hope you guys enjoy hearing me yap. But I started playing Edison format, and the first deck I actually built was Diva Hero because I was like, oh, I I want to um, I want to actually play like Destiny Draw and Destiny Hero Malicious and Miracle Fusion. And just play all of those cards like that that I played way back when. Because I remember when getting a Destiny draw was almost like just just like an a task and uh what am I trying to say? I've lost my train of thought here. An unobtainable task to get a destiny draw, right? So that was my first interest. I was like, I'm gonna hundred percent play Diva Hero as a very primitive build. D draw um, diamond dude, you know, I think I just went to like edisonformat.com, found a deck and uh, just net decked it completely. And we played, you know, it was fun. And then um, start to see that light sworn is like actually a good deck in the format. And I wasn't sure at first because I was like, well, one Lumina, one charge, two JD and two honest. Like, is that really going to be consistent enough to be good? So I picked the deck up from a friend, uh, my friend, Justin. And start playing it and immediately, immediately fall back in love with playing Light Sworn. I always wanted to play Light Sworn when I was a kid. Stuff was just way too expensive. Um, I remember playing the deck with like 
Rinyans and like I think I did have Luminas because it was just a rare and Garoths and Janes. You know, whatever like the stuff that was like fifty cents or a dollar was, but I didn't have JDs, I didn't have Honest, I didn't have Plague Spreader. I don't even know if Necro Garden. I think Necro Garden might have been reprinted as a gold rare by the, by that time. But when the Twilight Edition uh, Special Edition came out and Honest got reprinted, and then Gold Series came out and JD gets reprinted, that was when I really started to actually start playing Light Sworn a lot. So I start to fall completely back in love with Light Sworn, and I'm playing it all the time. You know, I have like the cloth play mat, the white player's choice sleeves, which are actually like the crappy new player's choice sleeves. They're not the player's choice sleeves. If you know, you know. But I'm very happy and I'm I'm actually doing so good in testing with my friends. So a little bit of backstory here. Our local shop uh, basically kicked us to the curb. They didn't want us. They didn't want to support Edison and Advanced. And we had been at a crossroads with that shop for a long time, as it was anyway. So we didn't go back there really at all. And I haven't been there in like over two years now at this point. So we would actually meet up at Sheets on Thursdays and play test at Sheets because no one, this was before I was married. I, I lived at home with my mom. You know, I couldn't have a bunch of people over. None of my friends, like they had small like apartments and stuff. They, nowhere, nobody really had a place to support, you know, eight or nine people being in one room at a t uh, all together. So we'd meet up there and we'd play and I was doing good and I actually felt really good. Um, so eventually it comes time for our first Edison tournament and this is at Picante TCG in Greensboro and I go and I'm a little cocky. I'll just be honest with you. I just feel so good. I'm a little cocky. When I tell you that after that tournament, I got the hell beat out of me. I don't think that I beat someone in a game that whole day. I got absolutely just full on demolished by everyone. And that really put me in a bad mood because at this point I've already left advanced format Yu-Gi-Oh because I felt like I could not win to save my life. I felt like I was just so bad at advanced. And I thought, well, if I go back and play a format that I lived through that I played through, I'm going to be better at it by default. Right? Like, but unfortunately that, that was not the case. Um, so, you know, I, I've never really been a person that gave up easily. I keep playing and I keep playing, keep going to tournaments and doing bad, keep doing bad, doing bad. And this is around the time now when James Ark starts playing or popularized Christia Sworn. This is the very first build, like Triple Christia, Triple Herald, Triple Soul Purity, Shire, you know, Thunder Kings in the side, like whatever it was, right? And at this point, I don't really even know who James Ark is. I'm so new to the format and the retro scene in general. So I just net deck it completely. I'm like, well, if he won with it, then I must be able to win with it too, right? Well, wrong, wrong yet again. Start playing the deck. I take it to a PS5 tournament or local shop. I just get demolished there. I lose there really bad. And I'm almost about to quit the game. My friend Justin talks me out of it. Then we decide we're going to go to this PlayStation 5 tournament in Reading, Pennsylvania. It's going to be like our little YCS kind of trip. So it's me and Justin and my teammate Cole, and then this guy we met named Jacob. Uh, Jacob's primarily a GOAT player, but Jacob also did top the first ever Ultimate Time Wizard tournament um, back in 2023 uh, with Frogs. I can't remember if it was Frogs or Hero Frogs he played, but he, it was definitely Frogs. So uh, we go up there, and I'm, I'm playtesting, and I'm actually feeling good again. For the first time in a long time, I'm feeling good. And I go there and I lose five rounds. I lose all five rounds. And at this point, I'm completely just like, I'm in the dirt at this point. I feel like such a failure because I look at myself and I say, I spent 20 years, you know, roughly playing Yu-Gi-Oh since I was a child. Why can I not win or top anything to save my soul from hell? That was exactly like verbatim what I said. And my teammate Blake I was in the hotel room. I didn't go out to eat with my friends that night. I stayed in the hotel room. I was in absolute shambles. And I cannot even express just the level of just disappointment that I felt. And this is me. I'm pretty sure I haven't really opened up about this on a podcast episode before. But I'm, I'm very transparent about it at this point now. I, I really kind of had a problem. But I uh, thought about selling all my cards and just quitting and just saying I'm done with Yu-Gi-Oh. I'm, I'm giving up. It's not for me. I, I don't have the luck that it takes to be good at this game. And that's what I said. 
Well, he ends up talking me out of it and talking me down. And, you know, I'm better, but I'm still very bad off. And I remember that next week uh, I got back to my job and my boss was actually on vacation that week. And it was just a time where I didn't need to be spending a lot of time alone. So I would just be, I do upholstery for context, like working on a chair and I would just break down and go in the bathroom and start crying. And a lot of men would never admit that, but I like to be transparent with my audience. I like to let people know that it's okay to have struggles. It's okay to be upset. It's okay to feel things and to express those things. And I've always told people like, if you don't like me expressing myself to you, then like, you're not my friend anyway. So yeah, and this was all about Yu-Gi-Oh cards, mind you. This is all about a card game. And there were a few other things in my life going on at the time that was making it very hard on me uh, mentally. But the, the primary source was from the game and just feeling so bad. So that goes on like that whole next week. And finally on Friday, I just have this epiphany. It was like I woke up and my whole perspective changed. I, I told myself, it's either time to get so good at Yu-Gi-Oh that I never feel like this again or it's time to sell out and just be done trying. And I said, I've never been a quitter, so I'm not quitting now. So it was like overnight, I like flipped a switch and I started approaching the game much differently. I started listening to what pro players were saying. You know, instead of saying, I'm so tired of drawing Wolf, I'm not playing this card anymore, it's garbage. I kind of started thinking about it. If I play 100 matches with this deck, how many games do I actually draw three Wolves? You know, I was very bad to deck build off of emotion and just take emotion into account when I was deck building, when I was playing like, oh, well, last time he had bottomless set. So I'm just not even going to summon anything. I'm just going to set honest and pass to play around bottomless. Completely just wrong. My complete my foundation of how I looked at the game was wrong. I didn't actually look at anything with results or think about like the big picture. I just focused on that game that I had just played. And ever since I started changing my mentality, I started saying like, instead of, oh, I got sacked. Oh, that guy's such a sack. Oh, my deck bricked. Oh, his deck's just powerful. Every time I sit down and play, I can't beat this guy no matter what I do. He cheats, whatever. I started saying, what am I doing wrong? Why did, why did this happen? You know, why did I lose? And almost always it was because I misplayed. I did something wrong. I missed something. And that's not to say that there's never been times where I, I don't still leave the table and feel like, man, like that guy just drew everything. But I always tell people like when you this is how I approach uh, matches when I play. If I win a match and there were no misplays, at least none that I've noticed while playing or thinking about the game after there were no misplays. You know, obviously there's no I'm not going to say cheating, but there's no like illegal activations. Like sometimes in the beginning I was bad to like have Lumina Arcus on the field and then like Lumina back a Shire to, to make Christy alive. Right. And then I think about that. And I'm like, Oh, I couldn't have even done that. Like, I'm glad that was just testing, you know, cause like I don't ever want to win in an illegal way. And I also don't want to win in a bad way. So just a few weeks ago, I was playing against my friend Sasha Egger at a uh, switch tournament at Picante. And there was a line that is lethal, right? So it's something like along the lines of I have a wolf on the field, he has a monarch, I think I have like a Sangin in my hand. And basically I do this whole thing where I like Brio back his monarch, which is very bad because if he has Battle Fader, I just gave him a free Caius. But I basically just said you better have it. And I end up beating him with like Brionic and something else it's enough for game but it's not enough for game through gores after the match he pointed out that had i used sangin and plague spreader to instead make magical android and use sangin to get honest and then attack over the monarch drop honest and flick 24 it leaves him low enough where a wolf gets in for lethal through gores and after that i was like oh wow you know like i did not even see that and I'd actually just talked with Frozen Soul that morning, like, hey, do we need to cut Android? Does it come up enough in Twilight? And that line alone was enough to convince me that Android will eventually keep coming up. Because if I have Sangin plus Plague Spreader, then I can essentially run over any monster, as long as both Honest are still in my deck. 
So after that game, I was like, you know, I won, but I easily could have lost. That that was a misplay, and even though I didn't get punished for it this time, if I play that a hundred times, then maybe I do get punished for it, you know, half of them or more than half of them. So that's an example for me of like a bad win. Like I won, but I wasn't happy that I won because I want to win with the best line that I possibly can. And then there's games that you lose because you misplay. Kind of like what I was just talking about where, oh, I did something wrong. You know, like I actually lost a game this past weekend to GYBU, um, Twilight versus Vayu. And we get down to where I'm at 1,000, he's at 1,100. Uh, he only has like one or two cards in his hand. I have a Dark Armor on the field with a Defense Position Plague Spreader with no Darks left in Grave. I'm not drawing monsters. So he has a face down monster, which I'm like, okay, that's either Hamster or Raiko. And I'm trying to keep in mind, I need to make sure he doesn't, he's not able to Kaius me for game. He has too many Darks for Dark Armed. So I just Dark Armed and attack over his set. And immediately when I attacked with that Dark Armed, I was like, crap, if this is Hamster, I probably lose. And it was Hamster. So Hamster gets the Raiko. He passes. He flips over the Raiko to get the Mills. Tributes for Caius. Hits my Dark Armed. Burns me for 1,000 for game, which was thankfully just game two. I ended up winning game three. But I could have potentially won game two. And the reason why... I'm not going to say the reason why I lost, but the reason why I didn't get more turns was because I didn't put that Plague Spreader in attack position. If I really feel like it is a Hamster then I should have put Plague Spreader into attack position as well. Dark Arm the set, which is which is Hamster, which gets Raiko. Then I attack the Raiko with the Plague Spreader. I lose my Dark Arm, but I have Plague and I have Threatening Roar set. So as soon as I finally draw a monster, I can make a Synchro play or you know whatever I need to do. But I wouldn't have lost that next turn uh, in the way that I did. So that's a misplay. That's something that you can learn from and you can... Take that, apply it to another game, and maybe that doesn't happen. So like now I know like for some reason if I can't clear the set monster and I'm low enough to get like Kaius for game, I need to just attack with the plague spreader or put the plague spreader in attack mode, especially when I have threatening roar. Because at that point, like what am I really afraid of? You know? And then the last thing I want to touch on is games that were 100 percent out of your control. So this is like when you sit down from like Dragon Turbo. And they're like, play a bunch of draw cards, activate Future Fusion, dump half my deck, in phase, activate all three Super Rejuves, pass. And you're looking at your hand, and all you can do is like set one monster and pass, and you just get OTK'd. And then the next game, the same thing happens, right? Like, can you walk away from the table? Like, what did I do wrong? Well, like, you, you didn't do anything wrong. You just got Yu-Gi-Oh'd. And that's okay, because sometimes that's just the way the game works. I've gotten just Yu-Gi-Oh'd before, and I've also just Yu-Gi-Oh'd plenty of people by like a turn two heavy storm double JD, you know, stuff like that. And like, they asked me like, could I have done anything better? I'm just like, no, like there's nothing you could have done any different that would change the outcome of that game because of the way that I open and the way that you open. And then there's nothing to reflect on. There's absolutely nothing like I should be upset. Like I did something wrong. I should be upset. Like they sacked me like that at that point is just Yu-Gi-Oh and Maybe you could say, like, oh, my deck doesn't have enough defense. You know, maybe if I did have, maybe if I'm playing pure Light Sworn, but I'm not on Threatening Roars, maybe I could say, maybe I should consider Threatening Roar to be able to, like, live through the quick OTK decks like Diva Hero and Dragon Turbo and maybe the Mirror in some cases and stuff like that. So, But for the most part, there's not really going to be a lot of time for you to reflect and just think about what you did wrong. So, like, don't stay hung up on that for too long, especially in those cases. Just move on. Go to the next round. YCS Indianapolis earlier this year, I lost round one because of a very weird situation where I have Arcus on the field uh, with Honest in my hand. My opponent like summons Dark Armed. Um, it's it's some situation like this uh, to where all I have to do is Celestia the Dark Armed and I win. Right, like the game is over at that point. But then you activate Zombie World, so I can't Celestia and I I end up losing. And I I, I think. I think maybe I had like Gardna Arcus or something like that because there was no way to clear the uh, the dad on the crackback. And I was like, well, there's no point in getting upset about it because that's just Yu-Gi-Oh. Like I ran into Frazier uh, on my way to the bathroom after he asked me how it went. And I told him he was like, oh, well, you know, sometimes you just get Yu-Gi-Oh. And I was like, exactly like um, on to round two. And then I won like the next six rounds straight because I didn't let that like trash my whole day 
for the tournament just because I got Yu-Gi-Oh'd. It, it was what it was. You know, you can you can just get Yu-Gi-Oh'd by random cards. But I kind of went off on a tangent here. So, uh, where was I even at? Oh yeah, so I changed the way I think about Yu-Gi-Oh 100% entirely. I do not approach the game, any any aspects of the game at all in the same way that I did before. I think about things very differently. I think about cards very differently. I look at everything as a learning a, a learning uh, situation. I don't even know if that's correct to say that. I, I try to learn something from every tournament experience that I go to, take it and apply it to the next one, rather than just saying like, oh, I got sacked the whole time, I, I bricked the whole time, whatever. And with that came a lot of positive results. So the first thing that ended up happening, and I, I say that this is an accolade, and some people, you know, I mean, it is to me just because of what it means to me. I'm looking at it on my wall. Big Boy Gaming had a 2K Edison tournament. This was like probably the second one that they had. Actually, I think it might have been the third one that they had because the first one I scrubbed out of, the second one I just streamed because I was so disappointed. And then this was kind of after I changed how I thought about Yu-Gi-Oh. But I played Pure Light Sworn at this tournament. And I think my one loss in Swiss was to Raikoko on Bayou Turbo. And looking back, I don't even know how I did it. Because that Light Sworn list I played was so bad. But I think that I was just approaching my matches with such a different mentality. And just thinking about like what can I do to make sure this game is as much in my control as it can be and just not sweat the small stuff that's not in my control. But I ended up getting third or fourth at that, I believe. There's a match on stream where I play Raikoko again in the top cut. And I can literally go back and watch that video and think like, wow, I have grown so much since that game. And at that point when I was playing, I thought I had grown a lot then. And I had, but when I look back now, I'm like, wow, like I I knew a lot then, but in the grand scheme, I knew nothing. And there's a point in the game, the turning point is where um I discard a smashing ground, I think for lightning vortex or monster reincarnation, and I keep a shield crush in my hand instead. And it was a known shield crush because he had dust shooted me. Now I end up losing in game three was I couldn't clear a Vanity's Fiend. I ended up having to like shield crush a set and it was it was a Vayu, so I just put that in his graveyard for free. But if I'd held the smashing ground, then I win that match. And I was playing well, like there were times where like I summoned Lumina into two back row, set a back row and passed, and he was like really confused why I didn't use priority. And he like summoned Sirocco attacks, I threatening roar, and then I like summoned Celestia, hit both back row and it's deprison and oppression like kill the Sirocco and I was like playing out of my mind, you know, like a couple turns later, I'm like at three names in grave with like two JDs in my hand. Or maybe this was like one of the earlier games. I don't think it was game. Yeah, it wasn't game three for sure, but I end up like summoning honest, bringing back plague, making Brio pitching a card to bounce the Aaron he took from me with Goyo back to my hand, then pitching it to like bounce back some other card that he had, which gave me the four names to summon both JDs. So just playing very well. Um, and like I said, end up getting like third or fourth or something at that tournament. And that's where it all started. So I always say that that's an accolade. I know that's not an ultimate time wizard. I know that that's not an RBT or a peak of the beak or whatever. But to me, that was more meaningful. That was the most meaningful thing to me that I had done. Like up to that point. And I love that mat so much. I've never even played on it. It's been in a frame on my wall since like the weekend that it happened. And anytime I run into something in my life that's challenging me, I always look at that and remind myself, like if I just apply myself and approach anything, you know, with a clear mind, I can accomplish anything that I want to accomplish. doesn't matter what it is. So that's the first thing. And that really made me feel good, but I was also still very hungry. <coughs> Sorry. I was still very hungry for more. I didn't want to stop at that because I was like, now I've got this little thing, you know, like, and a lot of people are going to laugh and say that that's, this isn't real. Like I want to do something to like prove myself. So I get back into the habit of going to basically every, every Edison tournament that there is, uh, over the course of that summer, I win 
I actually win one Nintendo Switch with Frog Monarchs, uh, which is like the only event I've ever won with a deck that was not Light Sworn because that's like the only tournament I've ever played in with a deck that wasn't Light Sworn. But I won a tournament with Frog Monarchs and got a Nintendo Switch, and I was like, dang, that's so like I can't only just play Light Sworn decks. I can actually play other decks as well. I just prefer to only play Light Sworn. Um, and then I ended up winning another Switch that summer with Light Sworn. Um, so like now I have a few little things where I'm just like, okay, I feel good about this now at this point. And YCS Richmond rolls around. This is about a year ago. So I actually feel like this weekend is like the one year anniversary of YCS Richmond or pretty close to it. It came up on my memories today where I had actually registered for it. So I'd been testing a lot. Uh, this was also after times two had started playing Christia Sworn and kind of changed a lot of the ratios around. Started only playing like two Christias, two Soul of Purity and Lights instead of three and three because the deck had a big problem with breaking in the very beginning. So I'm just, I'm convinced I'm going to play Christia Sworn. This is also after a long period of time of saying Christia Sworn wasn't good because all of those little accolades in air quotations I had, like winning switches and topping a 2K, were with pure Light Sworn because I just, I was convinced that the problem was Christia Sworn. It just wasn't that good. And this is after how far I'd come with like, the way I thought about the game and like my, my mental health within the game. But I was convinced, I think it, it was time to start playing the deck again. Looking back on it, this is a really strange build, but this is playing like two Christias, two soul purities playing glorious illusion, Graganith, you know, all of those like little tech cards that light sworn kind of picked up for like a minute. I was playing all of those <clears throat> and I felt really good going into the tournament. Played a lot. And I end up getting, I don't know, like fifth or something after Swiss. Only lost one one time the whole day at Tom Mac. And at this point, I'm in the hotel room and I'm like, I just got top eight at Ultimate Time Wizard a year ago. I couldn't beat the worst player at my locals. If I picked my starting six, I would still have lost. So I'm like, at this point, it doesn't matter if I go tomorrow and I get 2 0 by my top eight opponent in two minutes. It doesn't matter. I'm like, to me, to me, I've won this event because that was what I wanted. That was so incredibly important to me at that time. So, you know, most people would be like, oh my God, I'm so nervous. I, I did not care at all at that point. I did not care. The, the, all the cares had completely left me. I was just happy to be where I was. I get to day two, I beat Black Wings in top eight. So I'm like, now I'm in top four. And I'm like, now it really doesn't matter, you know, what ends up happening in this tournament. I really truthfully do not care what happens. You know, like, if I, if I like, knock my deck off the table, get a 2-0 game loss, and, and walk away. Like, it doesn't matter. I got the top four with Christia Sworn after, after a year of just being so bad, but just completely flipping a switch and just changing how I approach Yu-Gi-Oh! Here I am, top four of this YCS. And you know this story. I've told the story a lot. I end up losing to Fish OTK against James Ark, uh, which was my first like real interaction with James. Um, but I tell you, when you go from just being so pathetic at something and you look around and you're sitting at a table, you know, in the top cut tables with like Fraser Smith and James Ark and like my friend Chris Lee, who's my teammate uh, who went undefeated the whole day uh, and Tom Mack. And you look around, you're like, there are like multiple YCS champions sitting here. There's there's James, who's like. I don't even know how many tournaments he's won and topped. It would, it's a lot. Uh, and then like, you know, everyone that made it was Ernie, Ernie, the eventual winner, uh, Ernie Aranda, uh, who I believe he also topped the first Nats. I'm pretty sure. Um, tops does well with value all the time. And I'm like, I'm here because of hard work and determination. Like I can do anything. So I end up losing to James Ark. Uh, and that knocks me out of uh, contention, you know, to win the whole thing. Looking back on it a year ago now, if I had just played smarter, I think I probably could have won. I think that was a match in game three where I misplayed and it cost me. But I do plan on getting back there. I am, I am 100% not done. I am going to get back there to, to eventually win an Ultimate Time Wizard. That is my goal. I'm going to get there. I'm 100% going to get there at some point. One of these that I go to, I'm going to win it. But 
that was an unreal experience. Uh, unfortunately, if you get fourth place, you only walk away with a hamster play mat. So that kind of that kind of stinks. But it's just more of like proving it to myself rather than than anything else at that point. So I feel very good about that. Then in December, Big Boy Gaming has their biggest tournament they've ever had, which is an Edison 5K. So I basically, I don't even remember if I changed any cards from Richmond. Maybe a few things. I played a very similar list. And I play in that tournament, and I make day two, which was top 16. I come in at 15th place, went X2 in Swiss, lost to Black Wings and to Hero Beat. And I'm like, here we are again. You know, like, here we are again. This time last year, I was like crying because I was so bad at Yu-Gi-Oh!, and here I am. This is like a 120-person event, like the same size as YCS Richmond. Here I am, top cut again. So I play uh, the first round of top 16, which was unfortunately against my friend Mayberry. I end up beating him, uh, which gets me into top 8, and I play against Christius Warren Mir. I end up beating that, gets me into top 4, end up losing there to the same Blackwing player that beat me in Swiss, unfortunately. Uh, and that was kind of just due to the reason not only had I not figured out the black wing matchup at that point, but I also hadn't grown enough as a player to know how to play my cards, like to the best of their ability. Um, so like when I go back, I can think about that match even now and I can think about where it went wrong, what I did wrong, you know, stuff like that. And that's just growth. You know, it's just natural growth, but there we were again, um, topped that tournament at like, I think, third place something like that fourth place maybe it was fourth place i think it was fourth place um yeah if you lose in top four i'm pretty sure you get fourth place but whatever top four kind of arbitrary at that point but yeah so now it's the end of the year and i look back and i'm just like this was such a great year for me i cannot believe i can, not only can i not believe that all this happened but i can't believe i did it and played light swarm because i always felt like if I had to play Black Wings, if I had to play Vayu to do well, then I would just rather not play. Like, I wanted to play Lightsworn. That was my favorite deck. It is my favorite deck. That's what I wanted to play. I wanted to be the Lightsworn guy. And this is kind of like going off on a little bit of a tangent here. You'll have to bear with me. But when I was a young lad, a young Lightsworn player with my unsleeved common triple Jane, you know, triple Lumina... Rinian Graganith deck. I would look up to players that topped in one events um, and try to like talk to them on like Pojo forums or eventually talk to them on Facebook, get left on red. In hindsight, that's just because I was just an annoying ass little kid. You know, and they're just like, who, who the fuck is this kid messaging me? Like, I don't know who you are. Like, have you ever even been to an event outside of your locals, which is in a flea market? Like, <laughs> no, I hadn't. Um, but I said I wanted to be the light sworn guy because I wanted to be approachable. I wanted to help people become better, become better players. And at this time, you know, the channel was already the Edison Club. I had I initially launched my YouTube channel as Dark Magical Gaming, which was focused around the Dark Magician deck in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! And then I ended up quitting that to do the Edison Club, which I never actually expected to get to what it is today. Uh, we're very close to 3,000 subscribers. And a lot of people would say that's not like that big of an accomplishment. But when I was a kid, <clears throat> I dreamed about having 200 subscribers. You know, so like now that I'm almost to 3,000, it's like I can say I made it, even if in the big picture I really didn't. But um, my goal was like never to really be have like fame or anything like that. I still don't even think I do. Like I wouldn't call myself a pillar in the Edison community. If anything, I'm like a toothpick in the Edison community, but this is kind of transitioning now into like YCS Indy earlier this year. Um, <clears throat> when I went to YCS Indy and I'm walking around and there are people coming up to me and talking to me, wanting to take pictures with me. I signed a judgment dragon for a guy at YCS Indy. And I'm walking around and people are telling me how much they love the, the, the podcast, how much they love the channel, you know, how good the content is. And I'm just like, you know, this was never a want for me. Like going to an event and being recognized was never a want, but it feels so good for you to make a difference in people's lives and think like, you know, on Fridays when my podcast episodes go up, like these people are listening to it, 
you know, it's, it's helping them get through their day. And then that kind of all of branches out into like the discord stuff. Like I get messages on discord every day. People asking me, Hey, can you look at my list? Can you help me? What is your side deck plan? Uh, stuff like that. Like I made a whole side deck guide to Christia sworn uploaded it on my channel for free. I didn't charge, you know, anything for it. Now when I look back on it. I've obviously grown as a player in like the six months that that was uploaded, but you can still take information from it. You know, like it's not unvaluable. Um, like you could take that list of Christius one in that video, build it and then have the perfect side deck guide for all of it. Um, but it's just nice to be approachable and to be the, <clears throat> and to be the kind of person where someone's like, I have a question about lights worn. Maybe, maybe Mike will respond to me and I will message me on discord. I will. I've had people <clears throat> message me that I've talked to. I'm sorry. I'm getting choked up. <clears throat> I've had people that I've talked to on there for weeks back and forth about stuff. I've had people on there that have asked me for advice that when I gave it to them, they just didn't want to hear it. You know, they tell me I'm wrong. And like, in those cases, I just don't respond anymore. You know, I'm just like, okay, well, best of luck to you, you know, go with your gut kind of thing. And, um, it's just such a good feeling, you know, to, to start out feeling like I was so bad. I had nothing that I could do. I was such a failure, <clears throat> you know, crying over Yu-Gi-Oh cards at 25 years old. It's just insane and crazy. But when you feel like a failure, you kind of start to look at things in your life. Like, am I failing at this too? Am I failing at my job? Am I failing in my relationship? Like my home life? Like, just how big of a failure am I? And to see that transition is is amazing. It's it's such a good feeling. So uh this was a very long story of like the the light sworn like Oregon Trail, I guess. Like all the way from the beginning up until now. Um and we're we're still not done. We're gonna talk about a few more things before we get out of here. But before we transition to that, I'll just say like just get your your mental with the game. Just get it right. And if you can get that right, then that's the first step. I tell people when they ask me, how do you get better? I say, like, it doesn't, it's not even about cards. Like, the first step into getting better is just approaching the game with a healthy mentality. Number one, don't make that shit your whole life like I did and prioritize Yu-Gi-Oh! over everything because then it makes it even worse when you're not doing good. I think that's kind of what happened to me. But, um, yeah, just have, have good mental when it comes to the game. Don't, don't be a lose cannon, you know, don't like get tilted and flip the table over and think like, oh, no matter what I do, my judgment dragon always gets hit with bottomless, you know, like take that and apply it to a hundred matches and see how many times that actually happens. See how many times this situation actually comes up, you know, and if it's, a very low number then just don't worry about it you know like don't sweat it and learn from things but our last few minutes of this this is actually going to end up being a little bit longer of a podcast episode than i actually originally intended for it to be is going to be how i've kind of changed my mentality of the three main light sworn variants so I write articles for entcollectibles.com. Shout out to Tim Bailey uh, for reaching out to me and allowing me to do that. It's something I actually have wanted to plug on this episode uh, that I also started writing articles for Yu-Gi-Oh! When a couple years ago, like I said, I couldn't beat the worst player at my locals. So that's another thing that just makes you feel so good about yourself and look back. But I write articles for Tim Bailey for ENT Collectibles on all things Yu-Gi-Oh! I've done some about side decking. I've compared all the... Um, main lights worn variants to each other i've done like items to bring to a tournament i've started doing player interviews i just did one with anthony murray the glad beast guy we did like a q a session um and i plan on doing more of those as well but uh so around a year ago obviously because this was ycs richmond i was convinced that christius Sworn was the best way to play lights worn that there was no reason to play pure light sworn or twilight anymore and if you ask me to list them for you in order for from best to worst, it would be Christia Sworn, Pure, and Twilight. I put Twilight at the very bottom of the barrel. I said, it is not worth playing a bunch of shitty cards like Gores and Trag to just turn on one Chaos Sorcerer, right? That was like my whole mentality of it. And here we are, a year later, and now 
I feel like Twilight is the best out of all three. And I feel like, in my opinion, the more that we see Lightsworn get refined and the longer we see Edison format go on and on, I think that Twilight holds the number one spot. Lightsworn is one of the only, if not the only, deck in Edison that when one floodgate gets flipped, you cannot deal with it if you don't have heavier MST, and that is Light Imprisoning Mirror. That is such a thorn in your side as a Lightsworn player, especially if you play Pure, if you play Christia. Like, if you don't have MST or Heavy, and that card is on the field, then every monster in your deck that is a light attribute that is not specifically honest in your hand is a vanilla. Just wipe the effect off of it. It doesn't do anything anymore. That's one of the reasons why I feel like Twilight is the best. So, in all of my successes that I've had, successes in air quotations, because, you know, I still, I'm still hungry for more, but I've actually never done great with Christia Sworn out of locals before. Every time I go, I just lose to like random, random crap, you know, like get non game because the deck, the deck, Christia Sworn isn't known for having a lot of defense. So, a lot of times it's just easy to get gas pedaled, which I feel like when players play against Light Sworn, that's what they do naturally is they're just like, I'm going to throw my whole hand on the table and just say like, deal with it or don't, you know? And yeah, so it's always been hard for me to do well with Christia Sworn at locals historically. And maybe that's because there's like targeted hate. Maybe I see more light mirrors than I, I would at like a big event because people know me and they put mirrors in their side deck just for me if I'm coming to locals and stuff. But when I started playing Twilight, I initially started messing around with Twilight when James Ark came out with his on his channel. If you haven't watched that, go over to his channel, check it out. It's the original uh, Twilight list that he was playing. Uh, Shimmer, Shimmer Glimmer, or something like that was his alt. But he got to like number one on ladder playing Twilight. And I was like, okay, well, you know, maybe I can actually play this. You know, it has a lot of different elements to it. Sangin in the main deck, Crows in the main deck. A lot of different things that we hadn't really seen in Twilight previously. Like a lot of times it was just playing Chaos Sorcerer and then playing like Phantom of Chaos and like uh, Gores and Trag and then like Dark Arm Dragon, but you really didn't have enough darks to actually support playing Dark Arm Dragon. So it's very hard to summon. So I started testing that deck <clears throat> and I was like, wow, this is actually really hard to play sometimes. So I was originally going to play Twilight for YCS Indy. Actually, and looking back, maybe I should have. But I ended up playing Jay Cook's uh, Pure Light Sworn list with Triple Avarice. I don't regret it. I don't, I don't look back on that and regret it. I think it's a good deck. I think that I would have topped that event had I not misplayed against uh, Rick Novak uh, in round seven. Shouts to Rick. Super cool guy. Uh, hero beat player. Goes to the Chicago tournaments with uh, Eric Shen and uh, all those cool Chicago guys. Shouts to them. They're all really cool. Um, <clears throat> but I was originally going to play Twilight at that tournament. I didn't play it because I didn't feel like I could learn it in time. But uh, I was really inspired after Frozen Soul topped Nationals. Uh, or Yes, he topped Nationals. It was like a 500-player tournament, top eight, and he got like 13th place or something. So he got top 16. He made top 16. Whether, whether official or not, he got top 16 with Twilight. So I reached out to him, um, and I actually did a Collector's Rare Honest giveaway. So I had just lost uh, my baby at that time. Uh, we had a miscarriage at like 12 weeks, I think, 10 weeks maybe. And I wasn't really planning on going to nationals anyway, but the thought of it had kind of entered my mind. But at that point, I was like, yeah, I'm not going, you know, I'm not in the right headspace to go. My wife's not in the right headspace to be alone without me. So I was like, I'm going to give these away. So I start making posts in the discords. I'm like, whoever is the highest placing light sworn player Hit me with your address. I'll send you these two collectors rare honests. And I, I, when I say Light Sworn, I mean Light Sworn, Christia Sworn, or Twilight. I don't mean, oh, I played Raikou in my value deck. Where's my honest? Like, you're not getting them. I'm sorry. Um, so, Enraged Peacock, who is now on the Edison Club, you know, I guess caught wind of that and tells Frozen Soul. And the guy reaches out to me and I get his address. I send him the honests. Super cool guy. End up doing a video uh, with Frozen Soul on Twilight's. Twilight Light Sworn, which sparked a whole segment for the channel called The Training Sessions. It's a playlist on YouTube. You should go check it out if you haven't already. I've done one with Frozen Soul, Josh Johnson, like the Glad Beast expert, Eric Shen, uh, Keegan from E3 Yu-Gi-Oh! And I have a lot more in the works. Um, 
obviously preparing for these November tournaments has taken all of my free time away between that and content. But I have one planned with James Ark on Twilight. I also have one planned with Fraser Smith on uh, Hero Frogs. And I also have a follow-up episode to the one uh, with Eric Shen called The Value Redemption. Because if you haven't seen that video, we really need to be redeemed for that one. But those are all coming up. So yeah, I do the video with Frozen Soul, kind of get a little bit of an idea of how the deck works, and I kind of wanted to change some things about his list, but I ended up just playing his list card for card, exactly how he played at Nats, take it to my Switch tournament, like a couple hours later, and get top four with that deck, and I was like, man, this, this deck is good, like, the deck is very multi-dimensional, like, there's like a meme in our community now, because I played against someone that had a, that flipped a light mirror on me, and it literally, when I say that that light mirror, I was completely unbothered by that light mirror. That light mirror did nothing. Like, if that card was fucking stumbling, the, <laughs> the clown control card, it would have done more than light mirror did. Did nothing. And I was like, that is a feeling that I've never had um, with Lightsworn. Ever. And shout outs to that guy. He's, he's a good guy. Um, but after, after that, he actually ripped his own light mirror in half and threw it on the table. And I have it. And uh, sometimes I use it as a Gorse token or like a field center when I'm doing light sworn deck profiles. <laughs> Shout out to that guy. It was really funny. It's like a whole meme now. But when I walked away from the table, I was like, you know, that's such a good feeling to not have to scoop the game to light mirror. And so I've, I've only been testing Twilight and I tried to play Christia Sworn at a 3v3 because I thought it was a good call. And I got bodied at this 3v3 like three weeks ago bodied at it and i was like i don't think that christia sworn is the move in the way that edison has advanced so i went back to playing twilight and my build of twilight is a little bit different from james arcs and frozen souls like i play rhoda and armageddon knight i also only play two rikos and two J and i also play two janes and if you want to know why you can go watch my deck profiles i just did one but uh put twilight back together and i come in first place at a ps5 tournament at this shop that I have a, a uh, historical bad record at. So after last weekend, I can confidently say I feel like Twilight is the best build of Lightsworn. That in five or six years, when we look back on Edison <clears throat> and we look at like the solved builds of all the decks, I think Twilight will be known as the best just because it's so multi dimensional in a format that rewards things like that. Like you can look at decks like Vayu. So when you play against Vayu, you have an idea of how the game is going to go, right? You sit down and you know there's going to be like Rikos and Hamsters and Dark Greffers and stuff like that, right? But it's not always the case because that deck can just flip over a Raiko, hit like a Sirocco and a Vayu, and all of a sudden the game is over. Especially if they hit like, like let's just say they hit like Vayu, Sirocco, Plague, and then now they're just like, all right, summon Dad. Uh, banish these, get armed wing, you know, make summon back plague spreader, burial, put these back, summon them again, and the game is over, and there was never even a chance, and there's nothing you could do to prepare yourself for that happening. And then there's games you play against Vayu where the whole game, all they're doing is just setting hamsters, you know, and like setting Vayus. And there's no there's no floodgates against Vayu that are 100% like a catch-all that can just prevent the deck from doing nothing and shuts it down right like light mirror and shadow mirror i'm sorry not light mirror shadow mirror and imperial iron wall probably work the best but they still kind of lose to Ryko, which they play three of with hamsters and charge or like vice versa some some ratio of all of those so the deck is not one dimensional because it can do a lot of different things in a lot of different ways kind of like diva hero so i feel like twilight is kind of right there with that um it's very unpredictable if your opponent's trying to keep you off of light sworn names uh, with like something like Red Ari or Crow. They could also be like inadvertently leaving you on three darks or maybe they're trying to play around the dark armed and then they end up losing to Judgment Dragon or they Red Ari you down to three names, but then they didn't hit your one Caius in your graveyard. So now you, you're able to like storm the field, summon Sorcerer, banish something. And it keeps going back to the fact that Twilight, it's just much harder to get cheesed by it because it's not one dimensional like pure. <clears throat> There's nothing worse in the world than playing like pure light sworn or Christia sworn, playing against someone that's not great at Yu-Gi-Oh. Then they're just going flip over common light mirror in Magic the Gathering size sleeve, and 
<laughs> and it just feels so bad because that's just a thing that can happen. It could just happen, and the game is over. Like, if you don't have heavier MST, or if you had to use them earlier, or God forbid, God forbid you milled them, there's nothing you can do. You don't have an out in your entire deck to it. So, that's kind of how I feel about that right now. Uh, I don't feel like I'm going to change my mind either. Like, obviously, I might still play Christius Warren, or I might still play Pure, just for fun, just to change it up, because I don't want to play the same deck for forever. But I think that I'm always going to find my way back to playing Twilight, one way or the other. So, I encourage you all, uh, obviously, to make your own decisions, uh, form your own opinions. Maybe for you, you find that Pure is the best build, and it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what anyone else says. Like, oh, you're bad for playing Pure. If Pure works for you, and you're winning, and you're enjoying it, then play Pure. You know, if it's Christius Warren, then that's fine. If you like Christius Warren with Soul of Purity over Wolf, then that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that either. If you like Wolf, that's fine. If you like Glorious Illusion, then that's fine too. Just uh, keep track of your results. Keep up with, you know, what cards are working, what cards aren't. Don't get too emotionally attached to a card. Don't play a card in your deck like Glorious Illusion and say, oh, I won one game with with uh, Gragoneth. This card's a three of. I'm going to play it in every, every build, you know? Like, make sure you take that, you apply it to, you know, 100 games and just think about things in, in the big picture. Don't sweat the small stuff. So, guys, I think that's about all I have for today. So, and this is going to be a pretty long solo podcast, but I do accept fan mail. It's the Edison Club fan mail at gmail.com. You could find the email address in the description down below. So definitely send me um, some fan mail. Always enjoy reading those listener letters. People ask for advice, stuff like that. Check out my articles on uh, etcollectibles.com. And um, yeah, so hopefully some of you guys that heard this, I'll see you at the uh, BBG tournament here in just a few weeks. Hope you guys have a great weekend. And this is Mike from the Edison Club signing out until the next